This is lesson 4.4, determining restrictions on composite functions. In this lesson, the focus is on how to sketch graphs and determine equations of composite functions, and then to uh, identify the appropriate restrictions. So in this lesson, we're going to just get started right into examples. Now, the first example here says use the functions f of x is equal to x plus 1, so of course a linear function. And then we have g of x is equal to 4 minus x squared, a quadratic function. And so we have a number of different things that we need to do. The first of those things is we need to state what the domain and range is. So let's start with that. So if we have our first function here, f of x is equal to x plus 1. And we have our other function, which is uh, g of x is equal to 4 minus x squared. Uh, the first one, as you'll remember, uh, I said is a uh, linear function. It's in y equals mx plus b. And we know that for every linear function, of course, this function, if I was to just sketch it ever so slightly, would look kind of like so. Um, we know that the domain and the range is um, anything, um, that they're both members of the real number system. Okay. Now, if we go to g of x here, we have a quadratic function. And if you think about this quadratic function, this would be my y-intercept would be at 4 right here. And then the graph would be opening downward like that. So for the domain, uh, once again, we would say that x can be anything because the graph is going to go infinitely to the left and the right. And the range, the highest value we have is at 4. And then from there, it's going downward. So we say that y must be less than or equal to 4. Okay. So we've done the first thing that this example is looking for. We've stated what the domain and range are. Next thing we need to do is it wants you to sketch a graph of the composite function. y is equal to f of g of x and y is equal to g of f of x. And so what I've done here is I've taken the liberty of, uh, of starting a table of values for you. And you may not have this on your sheet, but that's OK. Um, what uh, I've done here is we have our input values x. Then we have our first function, g of x. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that value of g of x and we're going to put it as the input value into the function of f. Okay. And so uh, the first function we're going to look at, as I said before, is going to be y is equal to f of g of x. Okay, and on the other side, it'll be y is equal to g of f of x. Okay, so the input values that we're going to start with here, um, it's kind of arbitrary. I'm going to pick values that are kind of centered right around our graphs. So I'm going to go from negative 2 to positive 2. Okay, and you may use uh, more values if you want, uh, but let's start with these. Okay, so if you recall what our first function was, uh, g of x um, is the function 4 minus x squared. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just kind of write these on the side here just so that we can see it. So we have f of x is equal to x plus 1 just so we can see it. And then we have g of x is equal to 4 minus x squared. Okay, so hopefully that'll help a little bit. Okay, so now let's see what's going to happen for our output values after we put um, these input values in. So we're starting with g of x right here. If we put negative 2 in for x, we're going to have negative 2 squared. Remember, we've got to do our order of operations first, so that's going to give me 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. Okay, if we put in negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1. 4 minus 1 is 3. If we put in 0, of course, we would just get 4. If we put in 1, it's actually not going to be any different than negative 1 because we are squaring it, so we're going to get 3. And then lastly, 0. Okay, so that is just g of x. Now the question is, now that we've figured out what g of x is for these input values, what happens now if these become the input values into the function of f? So now we're going to put 0 in for the function of f, so we're going to have 0 plus 1 is 1. Um, 3 plus 1 is 4, so we're basically adding 1 to all of these, and so we would have the following points like that. Okay. And so we'll go and we'll graph that in a second, but let's go and deal with the other side here. So we'll put in the same inputs, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, and we'll see what happens uh, from there. So we're going to put negative 2 in for x, so we add 1, so that gives you negative 1. So again, we're just getting values that are 1 greater, so you have something like so. And now we'll take all of these um, values of f of x, and we'll put those into the function of g. So we have negative 1 squared is 1. So this will be 4 minus 1 is 3. Uh, 0 squared is just 0. So we'll have 0 squared. And so 4 minus 0 is 4. If we put in 1, we have 4 minus 1 squared is just 4 minus 1, which is 3. And if we put in 2, we're going to have 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. And the last one, what we're going to have, when you put in 3, you'll get 9 right there. So 4 minus um, 9 will give you negative 5. Okay. So let's take these values now and see what type of a graph that we have. So again, the values that I'm going to be graphing are this, um, this second uh, function right here. Okay. So when you have an input value of negative 2 right here, we get an output value of 1. So negative 2 gives me 1. If you put in a negative 1, you're going to get 4. And this is just a sketch. If you don't have a graph right there, that's okay. Just sketch it as best you can. Put in 0, you get 5. And you'll get roughly a quadratic, it looks like so. 
So if you were to sketch this out, you would say you'd have something like this and like this. And this is going to allow us to make our domain and our range um, for this new function, this new composite function in a second. Uh, let's take a look at this other one, g of f of x. If we put in negative 2, we get out 3. If you put in negative 1, you get 4. And then 0 gets 3. And uh, 1 is going to get 0. And so this one, again, is a quadratic. It's a little bit different. If you put in 2, you get negative 5, like so. And so if you wanted to, we can kind of see the pattern. We know that this point is going to be here and right here. We get another quadratic. Although notice that it is definitely different than the other one. Okay, So this may or may not um, affect what our domain and our range are. So uh, finally here, we've uh, answered the first uh, two parts of this question. So we did our original domain and range. We sketched this thing out. Now let's go and deal with the domain and range right here. So domain and range. Well, uh, for the function that we have on the left-hand side right here, the function y is equal to f of g of x, we can say that the domain and the range, well, the domain, uh, it's a quadratic, so it's going infinitely left to right. So we still have x as a member of the reals. That shouldn't surprise you, uh, because again, that, those were the, the domains for both the original functions. And the range um, is not going to be uh, anything right here. Again, you uh, need to look at your graph to figure this out. We have values that are at 5 right here and going downward, so y must be less than or equal to 5. And on the other side, uh, very, very similar. The domain is uh, x is a member of the reals. And the range is almost the same thing, where y is going to be less than or equal to, in this case, though that value is at 4. Okay, So that is your first example. Example 2 says, given the function f of x is equal to 1 over x plus 3, and g of x is equal to x squared minus 4x, determine an explicit equation for each constant function below, then state its domain. So we're basically putting the function into another function, and, uh, and like I said, find the domain. So I will take the function of f of x, which is 1 over x plus 3, and I'm going to put that into the function of g. So that's going to give me 1 over x plus 3, and then if you can imagine, it's going to be squared like so. So we've put all that information into this x. And then we're going to subtract 4 times 1 all over x plus 3. And if you were to simplify this a little bit, uh, you might just leave it as 1 over x plus 3 squared. And then this, if you wanted, you could distribute the negative 4 across the 1. So you'd have negative 4 all over x plus 3. Okay, I would have accepted either of those as a, uh, as a good answer. Okay, and then um, let's go deal with the other function, then we'll do the domain and range. So this one we're going backwards. Uh, we're going to start by putting g of x into then f of x. So we have x squared minus 4x, like so. And then we'll substitute that into this new function. So we will have 1 all over x squared minus 4x. So that's the part that went in for the x right here. And then we're just going to add 3, like so. So now what we need to do is we need to determine what the domain is. So let's first start by taking the domain of just the original functions. Okay, so I'll write domain there. We're just looking at domain, not range here. So let's start with f of x, and then we'll deal with g of x, and we'll see about what that maybe has to say about our composite functions. So if we look at f of x, remember what f of x was. It was this function right here, 1 over x plus 3. Well, you can see there that you can put in anything that you want, with the exception that we can't have x um, is equal to negative 3, because if you had that, we'd be going 1 divided by 0, which we cannot do. So x cannot equal negative 3. Okay. And if we come to g of x right here, remember what the function g of x is? That was x squared minus 4x. Um, that's just a quadratic function. And as you know with quadratics, the domain is always x is a member of the reals. So the question I have for you now is what bearing is that going to have on our new final answer? Well, let's go take a look. Let's start by looking at g of f of x. Okay, So that was the one that we had on the left-hand side right here. If you take a look, the only thing that we can't have in this fraction is x cannot equal negative 3. And this one is x cannot equal negative 3. I think everything else is going to work. So you'll notice that the domain is the same as what the domain for f of x was, just that x cannot equal negative 3. Now if we go over to f of g of x, the question is, um, are we going to get the same thing? x cannot equal negative 3. Is it going to be entirely different? Well, let's see. So we have 1 divided by all this, uh, this quadratic right here. And what I would encourage you to do right here is whenever you get a quadratic, let's see if we can factor it. Because remember, we're only going to have restrictions when you have a fraction like that um, if the denominator is equal to 0. So if you were to go and take this equation right here, and, uh, or this function, and factor it, you would have x and an x like there. What numbers multiply to give you 3 that have a sum of negative 4? Of course, it is negative uh, 1 and a negative 3. 
And so now that we've rewritten that uh, function, you can see that it's quite obvious what your restrictions are going to be, and they're different than what we had before for this function g of f of x. The restrictions now for this function are that x cannot equal 1, because that would turn that to 0, and x cannot equal 3. Okay, So sometimes finding the domain of our original one will help, and other times, as you'll see with one like this, um, you have to go a little bit further. Okay, uh, Let's go and take a look at uh, example 3. I think we have two more examples left. Example 3, very similar to the one uh, above. We are going to go and find the explicit uh, equation for each of the composite functions, and then we'll state the domain. So we start with uh, g of f of x. So we have g of, and the function of f of x is the square root of x. And then we're going to take that, we're going to substitute that into x squared minus 4. So it looks something like this. We'll have the square root of x, which is all being squared. So that got simple for, uh, substituted in there. And then we'll subtract 4. Recall that when you um, square a square root, the terms are going to um, be canceled. So you just have x minus 4 right there. Okay. And if we come over here to the other side, uh, we're going to take the function g of x and this time put it into f of x. So we have f of uh, x squared minus 4. And this will then give us the square root of x squared minus 4, just like so. Okay, So we've uh, written our composite functions. Now what we should go and do is tackle what the uh, domain is going to be for these guys. Okay, So write a little line right here and we'll talk domain. So uh, I like to go personally and take a look at the uh, domain of each of them on their own. You don't have to do that. You can take a look at uh, it here. But uh, what I'm warning you about is the domain is going of each individual function will uh, affect the um, composite one. So uh, let's do that. f of x, and uh, we'll talk about g of x. So the function f of x was just the square root, and if you recall, um, we know that when you take the square root of a number, it has to be positive. So x must be greater than or equal to 0. That should make sense. And g of x right here was the function x squared minus 4, and it had no restrictions, right? It's just a quadratic function. So what impact is that info going to have on finding what g of f of x is and finding what f of g of x is? So this is a good example of why you need to do this information first right here, because my worry is that some students are going to look at this and they're going to be like, oh, x minus 4, it's a linear function. Anything can go for linear functions. And that's the case for this, but not because this is a composite one. So what I want you to understand is because the restriction on f of x would be that x is greater than or equal to 0, that stays as a restriction through here. All right? And so because that's only the only restriction that we would have, we'd have to end up saying that x actually has to be greater than or equal to 0, because otherwise this part wouldn't be able to exist. Okay? If we go on to f of g of x right here, um, did we have any restrictions on this part right here, x squared minus 4? No, we didn't. But we do have restrictions underneath here. If you remember, we have to take the square root of a positive value. So we know that x squared minus 4, this part right here, must be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. And if you were to go and graph this function, you might remember this from pre-calc 11, you would get a function that would look like this, and it would go like so and like so. So if you were to graph it, it would be a step pattern of over 1, up 1, over 2, up 4. And this value would be at 2, and this value would be at negative 2. And if I'm looking for when is the graph greater than or equal to 0, you'll see it's greater than or equal to 0 on these two portions right there. So when x is greater than or equal to 2, and when x is less than or equal to negative 2. And just to prove it to you, if you pick a value that's greater than 2, like let's say 3, you'd have 3 squared is 9, 9 minus 4 is 5, you can take the square root of 5. And really big negative values, like how about negative 3? Negative 3 squared is also 9, 9 minus 4 is 5, that's good to go. But if you were to pick something in this middle region, the region that we're saying does not work like 0, 0 squared is 0, 0 minus 4 is negative 4, you can't take the square root of a negative 4. Okay, So this is a great example, different than the one that we dealt before, is where you really got to look at each individual function inside and work your way kind of downward. So the order of these definitely makes a difference. All right, last example, example four says, for each function, determine possible functions f and g so that y is equal to f of g of x. So this one's going kind of backwards. We're saying that this is the new function right here. We're wondering what could the original functions have been. And so the first thing I want you to note right here is that there are many possible solutions. Okay, There isn't always like a ton um, that are that easy to come up with. Some are definitely easier than others. Um, and we'll definitely go over this more in class. But uh, in both of these cases, you could do this uh, a couple of different ways. So um, what I would get you to note right here is that we have this function x minus 2 is all being cubed. 
And so if you wanted, you could kind of visualize how this could be two different functions. And this is how I kind of think this one through. So I like to use just a little let statement here, and we'll talk about g of x and f of x. So I think if g of x is this part in the middle, if I just make it x minus 2, do you see that we could, if we took all that information and we put it into some function that was being cubed, then we'd have this resulting function. So I'm thinking if you wrote it like this, if you made f of x equal to x cubed, well, then what would this all look like? Well, f of g of x would be f of g of x, we said, was x minus 2. And then what do we do with x minus 2? We substitute it all into x cubed. So we'd have x minus 2 all cubed like so. And lo and behold, that's what we were trying to do. You'll notice that these functions look the same. Okay, So again, we're just breaking this down into trying to imagine what are some possible scenarios for what our original functions f and g could look like, and these were the two scenarios that we came up with in that one. All right, let's deal with one entirely different. So again, um, just to remind you, we're looking for y is equal to f of g of x, and so what could we do right here? Well, again, this one is kind of um, probably obvious for a lot of you where I'm going to go. Um, there, there can be some more answers, but we'll just deal with these ones for now. So let's talk about what g of x and f of x could be. Well, if you take a look, we have this 3 plus x underneath the radical. So I thought, well, why don't we make that our original function that's going to go into f? So I will have 3 plus x as g of x, and then I will have the square root of x as f of x. So if you imagine all of this information, 3 plus x, is going to get substituted in here once I combine those functions together. All right, so when I go and figure out what f of g of x is, it's equal to f of, and then I'll substitute in g of x, which is 3 plus x. And then when you put all of that information into f of x, you have the square root of 3 plus x. All right. And so we were able to figure out what our two input functions were uh, in relation to our composite function right here. Okay. So uh, to conclude this lesson, uh, what did we chat about? We, we basically chatted about um, how you need to consider the domain and range of each uh, individual function before you deal with the composite function. That will have some bearing on your composite function's uh, domain. And um, we also, at the very end here, this uh, final example, we looked at how you can have a composite function and, uh, and go backwards and figure out what the original functions could be, um, although there may be uh, more than one possible solution. All right. That concludes this lesson.